Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at an Orion XX14G, a go-to 14-inch Dobsonian telescope. Well, first of all, what is it? Well, it's an astronomical telescope designed for looking up at the night sky. Its design is that of a Newtonian reflector. There is a primary mirror in the back, pretty big one here, 14 inches, it gathers a lot of light. It directs the light into the secondary mirror, you may be able to see the back of it here, which then folds the light up into this eyepiece here. This is where you look. To change magnifications, you change eyepieces. Its design is that of a Dobsonian base. It's a fancy word that just means it goes up and down and left and right, named after West Coast astronomer John Dobson, credited for popularizing its design several years ago. Okay, so I've done many reviews on Dobsonian so far, and people have asked me, is there a budget alternative to the expensive ones you've been reviewing, the Obsessions and the Star Masters? I don't have $10,000 to spend on a big telescope. Is there a budget alternative? Well, yes, there is. You have one of these things. You have the entire telescope with GoTo for around $3,300 almost in the pinch me category. You've got a bona fide large aperture open trust Dobsonian with go to for a little over $3,000. Now for comparison, the adder alone for the Argo Navis go to system for an obsession is around $3,500. So getting a whole telescope here for a little bit less money than that. Okay, so I think it's probably fair to talk about what you're not getting when you're buying one of these. If you get an Obsession, a Teeter, a Star Master, if you can find one, you're getting a handcrafted, made in USA work of art. It's a collectible. You're getting a mirror that is probably handmade by somebody, probably has his name on the company, and you're gonna get your mirror when he's satisfied with the fact that it's got a figure that is good enough for his standards. This is more of a commercial grade product, nothing wrong with that given the price that they sell these things for. And I don't think that the buyer of an Obsession, a Teeter, a Star Master is going to be the same person who's going to be looking at one of these. So these things have been in the Orion catalog for quite some time. They have a 12 inch, this 14 inch, and a 16 inch in both in telescope I version, that's the push to electronics, and the G, which is the go to version pictured here. The combinations have been available for some time, but they tend to come in and out of the Orion catalog. For example, as of filming right now, the 12 appears to be discontinued. So one other difference between a premium Dobsonian and a commercial grade one like this one is its weight. If you saw the review I did on the 15 inch Obsession UC, that entire telescope came in somewhere in that 70 or so pound range. This one is quoted at 158 pounds. It's an important thing to note because experience shows that the heavier the telescope, the bulkier it is, the less likely you are to use it long term. And in fact, the rocker base assembly alone on this weighs over 90 pounds. So if you know Dobsonian telescopes, if you know telescopes in general, there's no big surprises here. It's got some of the same components that you'll see on other Dobbs. It has a rocker base, it has a mirror box, there are truss poles and an upper truss assembly. But there are some minor differences in the way that this thing goes together that are kind of unique. So I'll walk you through those so that you know what you're getting yourself into should you buy one of these. So here's the telescope completely disassembled and as you can see, there's quite a bit of it here. So if you know telescopes and you know Dobsonians in particular, right away you're going to be able to spot the very first difference. The rocker box comes apart. Not only does it disassemble, they actually expect you to do so every time you use it. And the reason is, as I mentioned before, if you left it assembled, it weighs something like over 90 pounds and it's an awkward 90 pounds at that. It's very hard to move around. So I borrowed the scope from a club member and what he told me is this is the worst part here as far as the weight. So the ground board alone weighs about 55 pounds. And what he does when he needs to move it he sets it up on edge like this, and then he just rolls it to wherever he needs it to go. There are plastic guides on the side to prevent damage here. So the first thing you do when you put this thing together is you get the left side of the rocker box like this. This thing weighs about 26 pounds, and you'll see there are keyed holes on the bottom here. This will stand up by itself. And again, just to address the weight again, this 26 pounds, 
the entire rocker box of my X-T8 Dobsonian reflector only weighs about 20 pounds. A lot of that's the motor in here. So the right side is over here, and this goes in here like this. You can sort of leave this up like this without a lot of concern as long as nobody's gonna knock it over. And here is the front board. It's about six pounds, and you can see there are captive screws that screw into the side boards, which screw in turn into the base. So let me go ahead and put that together. We'll be back in just a second. The owner of this telescope is actually drawn on an index card where all the parts go. This is how he packs it in his Ford Explorer. So anyway, it's about three minutes later. I've got this rocker box all assembled. The next thing to do is to put the mirror box into the rocker box. And here we come to the second thing that you do want to pay attention to. I've got this oriented this way for a reason. You'll notice here, this is the side uh, that has the motor on it. This is the left side, and you'll see a sort of arrow-shaped keyway here. This has to go in the same way as this one here. Now, you can loosen this axis and move this all you, any way you want. It can go in any way you like, but I have to usually put this thing horizontal like this. So you need to make sure that it does key into the left side here. So this is the left side, this is the left side. The first thing you do is turn it around like this. And this thing weighs about 38 pounds. And um, yeah, I got it in the first time. So. so once you get the mirror box in the rocker box, there is one additional step. There is a long bolt here. And this goes into this receptacle here. And you tighten down, and it mates the parts together like this. Now you're ready for the truss poles. The XX design is an eight truss design, but they're doubled up, so there's only four of these that you have to deal with. And you screw them into the mirror box like this. So there's two hints about this. This applies not only to this model, but to Dobsonians in general. Number one, don't tighten these all the way because you do want some play at the top when you're putting the upper truss on. And number two, leave the dust cover of the mirror box on. This is the last thing you take off. You don't want anything falling down into the mirror. So I'll go ahead and put the truss poles on. Be back in just a minute. Okay, so we have the four sets of truss poles on. The next part is to attach the upper truss assembly. So there are four bolts here. There are four threaded holes here. You can put this on either way. You can left justify the focuser or you can right justify the focuser. I'll put this on the left side. I'm left-handed. I tend to like it that way anyway. So this is the part that a lot of beginners don't like and with good reason. And the reason is because there will be at least a short amount of time when you set this on here and there's nothing holding it on. That is, it's just, you know, by friction or by gravity holding this thing on. And before you get the, four, the first bolt in there, uh, you know, it could technically come crashing down on you. I've never actually seen that happen, but it could happen. So here's a close-up of the upper truss assembly. And I don't know if you can see this, but there's sort of a half moon shaped key here. This is on all four of these, and it helps you to place the upper truss onto the truss poles. It makes it a little bit easier. Nice feature. I wish more manufacturers would adopt that. Okay, so we're back with the upper truss installed, and as you can see, I've gone to the trouble of attaching the Telrad, the eyepiece, the hand controller, and there's one cable that goes from the motor housing down into the azimuth drive base there. There's one additional quirk I wanna to bring to your attention. The scope as assembled here is going to be quite front heavy. So to compensate for that, there are six of these little disc type weights. They weigh about two and a quarter pounds a piece, and these are threaded, and there are three bolts in the back. When the first time I did this, I was hoping to get away with not using all six of these, but uh, I actually did. You have to eat all six of those on here for this to balance correctly. It's not quite balanced. I got to thread this one on there. Okay. Okay, so now, okay, so I'll just, okay, so I'll just thread that one on there. So you might want to ask why. You might want to ask, why do you have to do this? Why don't they just get rid of the counterweights and just move the center balance of the telescope upwards? Well, you could. Some people do that. But you have to keep in mind, everything is a trade-off. If you get rid of the counterweights, then what happens is the fulcrum, that is the balance point of this tube, now has to come up a little bit. If it comes up a little bit, you're going to have to raise the height of the rocker box 
And so a lot of the weight that you saved by getting rid of the counterweights, you sort of have to come back, put back in due to the raised height of the rocker box and the larger mirror box. Also, there may be an issue with the height of the eyepiece. You'll see even with this thing with a fairly low center of gravity here, the eyepiece is up here. For me to look at this at the zenith, I'm gonna to have to get on at least one step, a step stool, a ladder of some kind. So when you raise the height of the rocker box, it can affect the height of the eyepiece itself. So again, there's no right or wrong answer to this. There's only what decisions the designer made when they drew this thing up. Okay, so here we are with the telescope powered up. One question I sometimes get is, can you use this thing manually? That is, can you just turn off the electronics and push it around yourself? The answer is, yes, you can. In fact, the owner told me that that's how he usually uses it. But in any case, I do have this thing powered up and I did a dummy align indoors so it thinks it's tracking right now. Uh, one nice feature about this is that it has a closed loop feedback system on the encoders. So what that means is if you were to manually disengage the clutches and move it around, it remembers where it is. Boy, I wish all go-to mounts had that feature. But in any case, the menu is pretty simple and if you want to see it run, I'm going to hit the M, which is the Messier button, push in M5 and it's going to ask you if you want to go there. I'll go ahead and say yes. So it thinks it's going to a globular cluster sort of out towards you. And you can see this is the speed at which it moves, not very far away from Arcturus. And you'll notice it does a final corrective action. This takes up for the slop in the motor. There's a little bit of hysteresis and it does that to take that out. And we're tracking. And here we are outside with the Orion XX14G, a 14-inch f4.6 Dobsonian reflector yielding a focal length of 1650 millimeters. With the 28 millimeter Orion deep view eyepiece, you get about 58 power. Put in the 35 millimeter deep view eyepiece and you get around 47 power. That's where I stayed for most of my observing. Later on, I did switch those eyepieces out for my Teleview 27 and 35 millimeter pan optics and my 13 millimeter Teleview Nagler for closer up views. So optically, how does this thing perform? I think it's pretty good. Pointing this thing at Polaris and defocusing a star for the star test, I'm getting pretty good patterns, not a lot of spherical aberration. If you care about these things, the star patterns looked a little bit better than the quarter wave diagrams in Suter's book. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. The optics are really good. So mechanically, also, this is better than I expected. So this motion is usually the good one. It's this one that I was concerned about, the azimuth, the left-right motion. In many cheap telescopes, this gets sticky, especially as the telescope gets larger. But you know what? They did a really good job on this. I was pleasantly surprised. So how does the computer work? Well, here's a case where I was kind of dreading telling you it wasn't very good. So if you've seen my other videos, you know I'm naturally suspicious of go-to systems. They're computers, they glitch, they fail, they do all sorts of weird things. But this one, again, pleasantly surprised. With a base two-star align, it would put the object in the field of the 28 millimeter eyepiece every time. Wasn't always in the center, but it was always there. Okay, so what can you see with this thing? Well, you can go after the obvious targets. You can see the rings of Saturn, the cloud belts on Jupiter, and its four moons, and I did do that. After that, I moved down to the showpiece objects in the night sky, M13, the ring, the dumbbell, M15, all of those objects, you know, the clusters in Cassiopeia. Those are not difficult. You can see those in a three inch telescope, but if you hit it with 14 inches, Boy, do they get a lot brighter, and there's tons more background stars. Put a two inch O3 filter on a low power eyepiece and look at the veil, and it is just fantastic. The telescope's field of view doesn't cover the entire veil, so you've actually got to get the hand controller and sort of drive around. It's a lot of fun to do. And in fact, the part of the veil nebula known as NGC 6960, that's the part that has 52 Cygnus, the star running through it, could be seen even without the filter at all. But come on, part of the reason you buy a big telescope is you want to see the really dim stuff. You want to go after objects that those little wimps with their six inch Dobsonians don't have any hope of seeing. So I'll give you a couple of mine in this part of the season. NGC 6946 and 6939. 
I showed a picture of this one briefly taken through the Explorer Scientific ED-127. This is interesting because it's a star cluster and a galaxy next to one another. They're both about the same apparent size from our point of view, but one of them is a few thousand light years away and one of them is a few million light years away. I also pointed this as at NGC 7331. I also showed a picture of that one in the ED-127 review. That's a spiral galaxy that people think the Milky Way might look like from a distant vantage point. It is the hopping off point for Stefan's Quintet. With a 13 millimeter Nagler, I could just barely pick out some of the brighter members of that small cluster of galaxies. Very exciting. So no real astrophotography to speak of here. Dobsonian telescopes are designed mainly as visual instruments, and that's pretty much how I used it. I did get this capture of Jupiter near opposition. Didn't really go all out for this one. This is more of a souvenir of my time with the telescope. Okay, so are there any drawbacks? Well, yeah, there's the obvious, the size and the weight. I'm not really sure how sportsman like it is to complain about the weight because this scope gets a lot right and for the price you can't have everything. So I had the scope for about a month and I never failed to take it out when I needed to. Although there were a couple of evenings where it was partly cloudy out or I was a little bit tired and it could have gone either way, but I did manage to get this out. So would that be the same case a year from now? I don't know. Studies have shown time and time again the larger and heavier the telescope, the less likely you are to take it out long term. Other than that, there really isn't much to say. This is a lot better than I expected, especially in both this azimuth motion here and in the quality of the computer. I have had some people express some minor concern about the apparent fragility of that red power switch. And by the way, I've never seen such a big telescope have such a tiny power switch. Uh, I don't have any problem with it. I will say though that with any electronic telescope, the power switch and the power jack are two of the more common points of failure. So there it is, an overview of the Orion XX14G, 14 inch go-to Dobsonian. You know, I find when people get to this point in the review, they probably know at this point if they're going to get one or not. I've done a lot of telescope demos for people and sometimes you'll show somebody something and you'll see their eyes just light up. And I know in my mind, I'm thinking, yep, he's gonna go get one of those. Anyway, if that's you, absolutely go for it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in a future video.